For just $24 per year, your subscription gives you access to an interactive space to share information with like-minded people with your privacy guaranteed. Your subscription will go a long way to help us maintain and improve our current media platforms. It will also help provide a budget so that we can begin the task of establishing localized media centers and radio stations across the United States. The best way to show your support and appreciation for what we do here at Black Talk Radio is to subscribe. Help us to help you be informed. Join btrcommunity.com today. The views and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. would have had serious consequences for the world financial system, but may also have empowered the people of Africa, something black activists say the U.S. wants to avoid at all costs. We slicing cake. We slicing cake. We slicing cake. Say the U.S. wants to avoid at all costs. We're slicing cake. Say the U.S. wants to avoid at all costs. Gaddafi didn't give up. In the months leading up to the military intervention, he called on African and Muslim nations to join together to create this new currency that would rival the dollar and euro. They would sell oil and other resources around the world only for gold dinars. It's an idea that would shift the economic balance of the world. Countries' wealth would depend on how much gold they have, not how many dollars they trade. And Libya has 144 tons of gold. Good evening. You are tuned in to Tando Radio Show here on the Black Talk Radio Network. My name is Scotty Reed. I am holding down the first 30 minutes of the program for you tonight. Dave will be joining us here in just about 30 minutes as he has some things that has him tied up, but that's okay. I'm, I'm here to fill in for him, and he'll join us again in just about uh, 30 minutes. So thank you for joining us today on Tando Radio Show. Before we get started, we just want to remind you that the Black Talk Radio Network is managed by the nonprofit media organization Black Talk Media Project and you can support our efforts by making a donation just go to blacktalkradionetwork.com or blacktalkmediaproject.org if you would like to support the work we are engaged in we actually just got engaged in a new project of reviewing some of the uh, release secret recordings that Nixon made of various individuals. Uh, we actually created a Facebook page for that, which you can find at um, the address on Facebook is at Richard Nixon Tapes. Richard Nixon Tapes. And I published a video. It was about 23 minutes. That audio is really terrible. So uh, what we're doing is is uh, taking the original audio files and removing some of the white noise from it, some of the electronic buzz that you hear throughout the audio. And then we're also uh, increasing the audio so it makes it easier to understand what Nixon is talking about. And the one that I published today was Nixon talking to J. Edgar Hoover. And in the summary it deals with the Black Panther Party. It deals with Bobby Seale, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party. They are discussing, this is Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover are discussing Angela Davis as well. Now, I haven't had an opportunity to listen to it in its entirety. I just enhanced the audio, turned it into a video, and uploaded. We actually have a work, a secret work study group where we have a few volunteers who will be working on actually transcribing 
that information, the audio, because sometimes you just can't really tell what they're saying and you might have to rewind it before you catch on to what they're saying. Other parts are more clear and you can understand what they're saying. And also, um, during the first half of Tando Radio Show, I'll actually be playing a breakdown of one of the tapes. Now, we will be publishing these audio files in their, I shouldn't say original because we're enhancing them, but uh, cleaning them up. But um, we're going to publish those without commentary. Um, But then on the ones that are um, relevant to what we discuss on Black Talk Radio Network, relevant to some of the issues we're dealing with today, uh, me and whoever it is that does the review that's in our group, um, then we will do a breakdown. I'm going to play one of those breakdowns of Nixon having a conversation talking about how the media is controlled by secret societies, which aren't really secret societies. People know about these clubs. They just don't know what what all goes on in these clubs. So when we say secret societies, it's not really a secret if you know the name of it now, is it? How can you say that's a secret society when people, everybody know the name, everybody know where the... um where the uh, club is located, but anyway, uh, Bohemian Club, a lot of people call it Bohemian Grove, that's the location, that's the name of the compound, the actual name of the club is Bohemian Club, all right, so we did, he was talking about the different members of the Bohemian Club who control the media, who work at these various newswire agencies, so is is it's very relevant today with the prevalence of fake news but i would say to you you've been getting fake news since the advent of television and radio from the united states uh in support of racism white supremacy and slavery so i'll play that for you until dave joins us uh also if you would also like to support our work you can also go to btrcommunity.com and join it's a 24 dollars a year subscription and there is a free 30-day trial period for you to try it out. Um, so um, check us out there, btrcommunity.com. It is a social media platform that we have set up as a result of the intrusive nature of these other social media platforms. Um, when we don't, I'm not personally telling anyone not to use them. I do warn you about what to expect. But when I joined Facebook, I knew going in, you know, that, hey, these people are going to be data collecting because they're running off a, a advertising model. So BTR community, we don't show you ads. That's how we pay for the network. And with enough subscribers, we'll be able to add all the things that you can do on Facebook to our own community. So that's $25 a year that pays for your security, your anonymity, and also uh, assuring that we will never have to data mine so that we can turn over information to somebody else to make some money to keep our work going. So that's btrcommunity.com, $24 a year. If you're interested in purchasing precious metals, you can check out prosperitymint.com. That's prosperitymint.com. Dave is an affiliate for that website. Uh, he does ask people to contact him first before they make a purchase so that he could give them some information um, that they may not find on the website. Okay, so with that said, um, I'm going to go ahead and queue up this interview. Well, it's not really an interview, but it is myself and Max Parth is breaking down this particular Nixon tape, which exposes fake American news media control by cult members so stay tuned for that again Dave will be joining us just about in 30 minutes hi the black talk let me just jump ahead past hi the the black um, talk Thank you for listening to Black Talk Radio News with Scotty Reed. I am joined by Max Parthis to discuss his delve into the Nixon tapes, 
which are recordings made by the former president between February 1971 and July 1973. President Richard Nixon secretly recorded 3,700 hours of his phone calls and meetings across the executive offices. These recordings played a leading role in the resignation of the 37th President of the United States on August the 9th, 1974. They remain perhaps the greatest treasure of information ever left by a president, as well as the most complex, controversial set of presidential records in U.S. history. However, today, these recordings remain relatively unexplored on non-Watergate topics. Max Parthas started listening to the recordings, which are published at nixontapes.org and publishing excerpts. Max is concerned about reports that only one person is reviewing the tapes and the chance that the person will edit sensitive information that will be of importance to both the black and slavery abolitionist communities. Max recently published audio excerpts where Nixon is discussing how the mainstream media, newspapers, television, and radio are self-censoring information who are part of or acting on the request of members of the not-so-secret-anymore Bohemian Club. The recording is from 1971, and interestingly, the next year, the Frank Church Senate hearings on Operation Mockingbird exposed the CIA planning stories in the American press. This was also a tactic used by the J. Edgar Hoover's FBI COINTELPRO operation to discredit civil rights activists and anti-Vietnam War protesters. Thank you for joining me today, Max, and can you tell us in your words why you decided to undertake this monumental task of reviewing these recordings? Uh, yes, absolutely, brother. Uh, I'll tell you in my own words why I took on this undertaking. First of all, uh, I had been getting reports and reading different reports now for a couple of years, ever since the first of the Nixon tapes were released and the media got a hold of them. And some of the quotes that came out of there only really convinced me of what I had already known to begin with. And that is that Richard Nixon, the first president to uh, be forced to resign for crimes, was a racist and a sociopath. And that he specifically designed the war on drugs to target black people as a response to the black liberation movement of the 60s. And he took it upon himself, as you said, to record his own conversation, some 3,700 hours worth of audio tape. And throughout that audio tape, he acts like he doesn't know he's being recorded. I mean, he literally says some of the most amazing quotes you'll ever hear. I'll give you a couple of examples of what has already been published. Nixon said, we're going to put more of these little Negro bastards on the welfare rolls, the 2,400 of family. Let people like New York Senator Pat Moynihan believe in all that crap, but I don't believe in it. Work, work, throw them off the rolls. That's the key. I have the greatest affection for blacks, but I know they're not going to make it for 500 years. They aren't. You know it too. The Mexicans are around a different cup of tea. They have a heritage. At the present time, they steal. They're dishonest. But they do have some concept of family life. They don't live like a bunch of dogs, which the Negroes do live like. And then there's another quote where he said, Bill Rogers has got, to his credit, it's a decent feeling, but somewhat sort of a blind spot on the black thing because he's been in New York. Well, they are coming along. And that, after all, they are going to strengthen our country in the end because they are strong physically, and some of them are smart, and so forth and so on. My own view is that I think he's right if you're talking in terms of 500 years. He said, I think he's wrong if you're talking in terms of 50 years. What has to happen is they have to be, frankly, inbred. And you just, that's the thing, the only thing that's going to do it, Rose, that's an acting president sitting in the White House talking about how black people need to be inbred. And when he says inbred, he is talking about assimilation, about integration, about just making them vanish. <laughs> so I also looked further, Scotty, and I saw that 
The only person who is handling the editing is Luke A. Nichter. He's a professor of history at Texas A&M University. And I don't challenge his credentials, which are listed there in full detail. What I challenge is the possibility that he might be a freaking racist and might purposely omit or take out things that have not been found yet that could be incredibly damaging, not only to the U.S. government, but also to uh, the, the people who surrounded Nixon then and now. And if you just take a look at the uh, nixontapes.org, you'll see an image of this uh, person who is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white Texas A&M University professor. I think it's, uh, it's dangerous just to have this person going through these very sensitive tapes. So I took it upon myself to start listening, and I asked a few other people to help me out. I've only gotten in a few hours with Scotty, and I wasn't looking for anything about the Bohemian Groves, but I happened to find it. It popped right up there, and I sat there listening to a sitting president discuss the power possessed by this secret society, how deeply embedded they were in all of our systems, and how they were told uh, that they have to put loyalty to the society ahead of loyalty to the nation. He even talked about how uh, specific network televisions uh, uh, companies were bought out by the Nixon administration to specifically either not talk about Bohemian Groves or if they do talk about it, only talk about it once and then try to spin it so it sounds better. This is 1971. Nobody was really talking about the Bohemian Groves until, you know, 2007. So we're going back to this secret society having this kind of power back with Nixon. Anyway, the tape will unfold and show all of that. Well, what I, I have would, been asking... Go ahead, Scotty. I would like to add a side note to that is that the Bohemian Club existed well before Nixon came to power yes. as I found information that the Manhattan Project which produced America's nuclear weapon, was discussed at the club first. Right. The atomic bomb was birthed at the Bohemian Groves. Amazing. So, yeah, when Kennedy was talking about uncovering these secret, secret societies, I have to wonder now if the Bohemian Groves was what he was talking about. Um, so, <clears throat> in any case, I've been asking people to, if they, if they have the time, you don't have to sit there and do it for hours. I'm not doing it for hours. When I have some free time, I sit and listen to uh, a particular tape all the way through and tell, you know, see if I can find anything. So if you have that time, do that. Cause I believe the smoking gun to our problems will be found right there in the Nixon tapes. And, uh, we need people to research it and look through it who are not, who are, who don't have the potential to be as biased as the one person looking through them now. And I plan on making a, forum on uh, Facebook and on the BTR community where people can start to uh, organize our study efforts on this and share the information we find. Well, let's get into this excerpt that you have provided me with. It's about nine minutes long. At any time that you would like me to stop the recording so that we can focus in on any particular thing that's said, just let me know, Max. Right, and you do the same, Scotty. If something stands out for you, just stop it. So what I uh, wrote the city metal where things stand here is we have now discovered that Scott Perry is the president to go is opposed to your coming. Uh, he's okay, to be knocking off. Well, I don't know. I, I guess, I've been trying to check it out. I don't think so, but I just didn't like right, 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 right. Ron, at my suggestion, talk to Walter Cohen last night. I asked him to call in to get squared away on the press, the whole, you know, the reaction press thing and all that. Uh, the wire, sir, you, your speech is going to be reported. CBS has already told Ron that they've made a deal and they've, they've got it covered. Uh, hey, Scott, I stop right there. Reported by, by a guest, by a member, probably. Uh, you may have to rewind it just a little bit, but right now, just so people understand, he's talking about a public image of the Bohemian Groves and how he just recently contacted CBS and they agreed to his demands. He'll go in further on not only CBS, but also two other stations or networks that he uh, confronted and made demands to, and they seceded to these demands except one. Now, I would like to bring that into current context and the 2016 presidential uh, contest 
uh, through emails that were revealed by WikiLeaks, there was a strategy that was thought up by the Clinton campaign called the Pied Piper strategy. And this strategy was to get their quote unquote friends in the media and it has been revealed that high level members of the Obama administration had siblings who work in the mainstream media and the strategy was to elevate people like Ted Cruz and Donald Trump by giving them extensive media coverage above and beyond any coverage that any of the other Republican candidates got. Um, also, I was listening to a, I'm trying to recall the man's name. I think it's Ed Schultz. Okay. He used to work for MSNBC and he works for Russia, works for Russia today, the uh, Washington based media company that focuses on politics and issues here in the United States. So he mentioned that he was due to do a live coverage um, while he was at, M at MSNBC of Bernie Sanders announcing his candidacy for president. And he got a call from executives at MSNBC telling him that they were pulling the plug and they were not going to cover it. I think that it, that I think that shows that the practice is still uh, in existence and that the American public is still being manipulated by people in high places with political power using the American based media. Yeah, this is actually, they're talking about criminal activities. I mean, what kind of country do we live in where the president dictates to the media what they talk about and literally pays them off in doing so? So, Scott, if you just rewind it a little bit, we'll start from there. Uh, the reaction, press thing, and all that. Uh, the wire service, your speech is going to be reported. CBS has already told Ron that they've made a deal and they've, they've got it covered. Uh, UPI has or, by, by, yes, by member, probably. UPI has uh, refused to abide by our, our uh, press rule. They will not in any way take, the, they wouldn't consider any pool coverage, you know, that proposal that we had talked about. They wouldn't consider because they, they will, they say they can get the story and they're not going to be bound by any rules not, not off the record. I want to stop it right there because I mentioned in the opening of this podcast that the CIA through Operation Mockingbird was planning stories in the American press. And you can actually pull up a YouTube video of Frank, former Senator Frank Church, who I believe is deceased now, where he mentioned that the CIA was publishing stories and they had the cooperation of UPI. So while it may seem like they're being ethical in not agreeing to uh, Nixon's rules, they were working with the CIA. And that is all recorded in transcripts from that committee, the Frank Church Committee, uh, on the CIA planning stories in American press. In this conversation, what you're referring to right here, Nixon uh, basically says UPI refused to do what they told them to do, but they're only going to play it once, and then they're going to put a good spin on it. So they're on board in that manner. So it's really a paper protest. Let's continue. Uh, the Grove concern that Trojan had, Trojan talked with Ron about the coverage they found that it ended Ron well, had way. Let me say, it. Trojan was a goal. And so it was for my coming person or letter said it was against it and I wrote said I agreed I wouldn't come right back this way and I should have filled Ron in on this before he talked to the Trojan. I did it. You did it. Okay. Yeah. You know, did Ron tell Trojan the plan to come in without the press? Yes. Without Secret Service? Yes. He knows. Yeah. And what was Trojan's view? Come or not come? Trojan's view was not come. He still won. You know, he didn't get it. Ron didn't raise the question whether it come or not come. They finished the whole thing and Ron said something about, well, I guess everybody's you know, looking forward to this or something. And Trojan said, well, can I speak with you very frankly? And Ron said, of course. Then he said, let me point out that there are, and this apparently is, is some of the old guard. I can see how it would be there. Hey, stop Whether right there, Scott. I checked with our man's man who's out there. Just to put it in perspective, what he's doing right now is talking about how members are going in, and because they're such high uh, station members, like 
congressmen, presidents, vice presidents, things like that. They're bringing in these secret service and the secret service is leaking out secrets that shouldn't be leaked out. So the Grove was saying, and he said the old guards in particular, old guard members are people who have been members of the Bohemian Grove for 40 years or more. He's saying the old guard members are saying, you got to leave those people behind and come by yourself. And then later at one point, he even mentions that Nixon shouldn't come at all because it's causing too much controversy. And that kind of reminds me again, I like to try to make things uh, relevant to recent happenings and news that we see occurring during this time period. But that just reminds me the commentary on the Secret Service leaking information. I would call them those people whistleblowers, just like we have. I think his name was Jeffrey Skilling, who blew the whistle on the CIA torture Program and was prosecuted by the Obama administration for leaking that information. His brother is a member of the group who has uh, talked about, uh, has so low key his advance that, that he had, can't give me much of a reading mark. But he said one of the concerns is that, that breaks the growth tradition. No, it's not that it breaks the tradition, it's that it puts a public spotlight on the growth. And that there is the appearance there of this secret gathering over three weeks of all the power in the country and what the hell are they up to, for one thing. Yeah. The other thing, the drinking and debauchery business right, is there. They've got a lot of prostitutes in the area, apparently, that they bring in. And uh, they're afraid that's going to be turned into the huge encampment of the lumber mill or something. I don't know. Monterey, you know, you know, it's much real. But uh, all the horrors. I want to stop it right there. You mentioned Donald Trump, uh, possible alleged use of prostitutes. That's what, if I'm not mistaken, and I heard that clearly, Nixon was expressing a concern about the debauchery and the prostitutes uh, that these members would bring in to the club. And then you got future presidential candidates or congressional candidates. I'm not sure, but he said a candidate for government, um, you know, there as well. And so what I guess what he's expressing concern is, is that that information could be used to blackmail a future president or congressperson. And, you know, we've seen those concerns expressed about Donald Trump and the infamous steel dossier where they claim that he had people peeing on him in, in Russia and what have you. Yes, Scotty. And, you know, the Bohemian Groves. And, you know, I, as I got to repeat, I didn't go in looking for this. I'm looking for proof that the war on drugs was specifically meant to target black people and to use that in an international court of law as proof of crimes against humanity perpetrated by the President of the United States of America. That was my goal. I was a shock as hell to he hear this and I suspect I'll hear a lot more Bohemian Groves has uh, a history of using live sacrifices in uh, their ceremonies which is called uh, I believe it is the uh, ceremony of discarding care or something like that where they worship this ancient god and uh, swear to not give a damn about anybody so yeah this is this is powerful and it shows that the president, while he was an acting president, was a member working within this group, and his priorities superseded that of the United States government and its people. Instead, his priorities and his allegiance was to the Grove. He was doing what they told him to do. He was repl- re- uh, relaying this information to an unknown uh, person by the name of Bob, and people who assume it might be uh, Ehrlichman or one of those, but I don't know yet. In any case, this is a confession of crimes. <laughs> Anyway, I'm done. There you go, Scotty. It's part of every global tradition. And uh, some of the underdogs do go down there and screw around. But it's, uh, they're afraid that by putting the spotlight on, let me say it on Also, that the location of the road will be so pinpointed publicly. Let me, let me say that. It's very, I, I frankly don't think myself, and I, I, I just don't think that we should have probably gone through this earlier. And I think we can personally get out of it. Uh, we, uh, what the hell, so I don't come. And uh, then, uh, then, frankly, there will be a lot of people within the grove, those people that think I should have, will just be pissed off as hell at the old guard. And the old guard guys will have to take it. We'll just say the president in deference to the, to the, to the he puts the grove of the idea of coming, he'd like to come and will not come. I think 
we ought to do it that way. No, I just don't think we ought to chuck it out there. Turn against the run all the negatives. I think like our negative gets another reason. Uh, it pours out there and I've been trying to uh, get to him. You see, don't have people that are just going to tell us that, that who would like us. Let me say this. I don't know the well. The overwhelming majority would love it. Is it if that's the overwhelming majority would love it. That's no more. But on the other hand, it's like these got in conservatives. Uh, the overwhelming majority would love it. And if you've got that nitpickers, could sure. just knock your brains out. Sure. I don't know Bear, who the hell he is. What's he? He is uh, Walter Bear, is his name. He's at a Price Waterhouse in New York. Oh, Price Waterhouse. I met He's an accountant. I mean, he's about your age, I guess. Uh, not one of the older guys. Yeah. Oh, but I don't know this Bear. The one I know is Julian Bear. Probably smart. This was the place of Walter Bear. And what Joanne then said is, Bear is your ticket. Bear. When our bandstand got there, he yelled at Baird. And Baird, the bandstand said, is there, uh, he asked the first question about a helicopter landing. Baird said, let me start out by saying that I sincerely hope that in making this quick check, he will then report back to Washington that it isn't feasible for the president to come. But Mike said, as they got through the whole thing, and Mike made it clear to him, we didn't plan to bring any reporters, we didn't plan to have secret service men, you weren't going to bring a whole entourage in and all this stuff. Then he backed down. By the time they finished the, the planning meeting, Baird was really quick. Uh, Are we sure this? Okay, we cannot let the bench man, you know, uh, you know uh, talk themselves into, know. to what we want. You know, get the goddamn truth with our heart off. I told him that he said it. He said the guy said at the beginning that, but he said by the time we were through, we didn't push the helicopter, we didn't push for, uh, you know, anything to do with it, you know. That he back, he, he, by then was, was his guard was much more relaxed. Uh, but Trojan says that Baird sent you a very tough letter earlier in the year saying, please do not come to the Grove. But Trojan intercepted the letter. Oh, I didn't get it. Yeah. Baird apparently consulted with him, with Trojan. Again, I, I think what we're hearing now is a, the explanation of why the Grove feels like they've been getting too much exposure because of the high profile members. They're like, we didn't send the helicopter. We normally send a helicopter to get these guys, but this time we didn't send a helicopter and we didn't have a motorcade and we didn't have all these things. And at one point we even had to say, look, too many people are paying attention. So just don't come at all this time. You just skip it because they're following you. Right. I think wow. I think we heard uh, earlier was he was saying that they don't want the location to be given up. Well, they I think that what they were saying is that it's becoming very public, and once it becomes ex public, amount so much people know it just becomes a target. So the, uh, he may have been discussing uh, the potential of moving the location, but I think that tradition won't let them do that. Bohemian. You can't tell about why did he write it up? Why did he write it up? Bear because of this. Bear because it had uh, been discussed amongst others and by the uh, you say you decided no, this is what happened to the Bear Democrat for Colorado. We don't know. But then they don't think it's political. That was why Trojan wrote his letter to you saying you shouldn't come right. He wrote a milder letter. Well, Trojan, there he is. I guess Trojan was the one that urged me to come earlier. I know. He stripped it. That's right. And he changed his mind. So I said, fine, I won't go. And Troy's view now is not that it's, you know, that there's any unanimous view you should come. It's that there is a little segment. Is it worth it, though? Is it really worth it to go the hell out there and have a little segment raising hell? So that's my, that's my question. We've got to go better than guys. We've got lots of them now. Because we don't want to be talk. I don't want to talk ourselves into it, Bob, because uh, my view is that uh, it's really not worth it. It is not worth it. Frankly, going out, and then it, we can screw the press corps that way too. They don't get a trip to California, you know, which a lot of them want. Them no, I don't really think so. They, they will, uh, but I, I, I don't really think. I think they'd be delighted. You wouldn't screw the press corps. They, they think it was great. Of course, yeah. Because there, there's no big stir in the press. The wire services are very upset, and of course, the chairman of both the wire services are at the go. I want to stop it there. He said the wire services, that's API, UPI, what they're talking about okay. is these news wire services that are there also uh, picked up 
by smaller out news outlets, you know, like on a subscription base, um, on a subscription base, because I once tried to interview a person who had written an article that was published by the Associated Press, and he said that he could not in- do the interview with me because it was against the rules of the Associated Press. And so we just heard him say that the uh, the executives of these wire services were fully on board and also members. members of the Grove. Yep, old guard members. So this is really just confirming um, the Frank Church Committee, the COINTELPRO operations, um, to demonize the Black Panther Party, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, in the press, in the press participated. So, you know, this is just really confirming or more confirmation of what people should know because a lot of people, millions and millions of people tune in to the corporate media and it's really a lot of fake and distorted news. And this is why I believe there is an attack on independent media. Pretty much is a confession of all of that by a sitting president right here in this little eight minute tape. Well, we have about a, a one minute left and we will go ahead and play that out. Fine, that's the point. What about the gridiron analogy? You don't buy that? No. That's why. Well, they don't buy it just because that's your quarter. It's a different place. And, it's not uh, part of the this was a part that confused me. He was talking about another group called the Gridirons or something like that. And I've never heard of them. The press is in a gridiron, too. And they filed a formal protest on the gridiron last year. But then the neighbors said, no, not the working press. Because there's only 50 members of the gridiron. People that aren't members are what they've got against it. We're sure smart enough to do that son of a bitch for sure. Don't know what you're Getting out of the gridiron and the White House correspondence. Well, that's the smartest thing we're going to do, believe me. Okay, that's pretty much it right there. Looks like they were um, wrapping it up. I did look up the Grid Iron Club and a Google entry says it's a charitable organization. The Grid Iron Club and Foundation was founded in 1885 as the Grid Iron Club of Washington, D.C., one of the oldest and one of the most prestigious journalistic organizations in Washington, D.C. So there's a, another connection to the media being controlled wonder- by members of these secret societies. Mm. 1885, 20 years after the emancipation, just around the time that the KKK was born. Right, and this also, you know, we can point to this as there was all, white white supremacy has always been promoted through the American press, and I'm sure that these organizations, these journalistic organizations were behind or had a hand in all of the racist commentary and news reports that were coming out uh, concerning the oppression of black people. Because you got to figure this is doing the black codes. I bet you they wrote publications justifying com- convict leasing and the like. Yeah, this is this is powerful, man. And I, let me ask you a question. Do you think that just this we're here, what we listen to today is evidence for crimes of, I don't know, even up to treason? Because literally you're betraying your own government. You're, it is subversive. Uh, it is right. subversive. Yes, it is. Man. And then on top of that, to show, without a doubt, he's telling you that both of these wire services are run by people who are old guard members of the Bohemian Groves. And their allegiance is not to the news. It's to the Bohemian Groves. Yes, and whatever it is, to they the want truth. to get out. Yes, yeah, not to the truth. It's not to facts. Maybe this will get out further and, and it will cause a buzz. In the meantime, I'm going to keep looking because if we can find this in, in only a couple of hours, it's a, you know, imagine what is else is in there. And before they disappear from public uh, access, please give us a hand to go through these. I want to end this broadcast with a quote from Malcolm X. This is the quote that caused me to found the Black Talk Media Project, which manages 
the Black Talk Radio Network. So let me pull that quote up, and this is Malcolm X's quote. The media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. There was a warning that was issued by Malcolm X in mid-1960s, and it's prophetic. It's very prophetic, as I'm not sure he was aware of all of these connections to these secret societies uh, that these executives of the American media had. But Max, I want to thank you for joining me today. Did you have any final comments? Yes. Uh, real quick, I just want to quote my brother Swift Justice, who recently told me that in reply to my uh, asking, you know, what can people do? They're asking me what they can do. He said, it's not about what you can do. It's what you are willing to do. Think about it. Thank you, Scotty. I appreciate you allowing me to share this story here on Black Talk Radio Network with Scotty Reed. Look forward to our next program of New Abolitionist Radio this Wednesday at 8 p.m. right here on the same network. This has been Scott. All right, I'm going to end it there. Um, let me check the board, see if we got Dave on. Uh, let me see. We don't. I don't see Dave. Um, so uh, we do have uh, Mario wants to chime in. Uh, Mario, thank you for calling in the Tando Radio Show. What's on your mind? Greetings, Brother Scott. Can I hear? Yes, you can. Oh, great show, man. Very powerful information. Very powerful information. Um, I was just calling in because uh, I didn't catch the beginning of that recording, and I was wondering if you could, uh, first and foremost, uh, let me know what the name of that is so I can do some further research on that. And um, also um, maybe give a summary of it uh, because it was very difficult to hear uh, and make out. And uh, number two, also, to add on to uh, some of the information that you were giving out, uh, you know, the Rockefellers and uh, Carnegie, uh, they pretty much took over the media during, right, you know, during World War I, uh, you know, because they were funding both sides and they wanted the war to continue uh, when it looked like Germany was, was, was about to go ahead and get the knockout punch to, to England. So they drummed up support of the American people through pop propaganda, but uh, Rockefeller uh, bought up a lot of the the media institutes as well as putting a lot of the editors on the payroll. So, um, and, you know, of course, they're members of the Bohemian Grove and all these other secret societies. So, you know, you you guys are on point and uh, powerful information, man. Keep it up. Yeah, you can find the um, podcast where you'll be able to hear it better. Now, I did not enhance that audio. Max did that when he just sent me the clip. But I have taken it as a project under Black Talk Media Project. We created a Facebook page called At Richard Nixon Tapes, uh, where we'll be publishing those. I published an uh, enhanced version today where it, he was talking to J. Edgar Hoover. I'm right now going through the section where all the tapes are uh, him in conversation with J. Edgar Hoover as well as other people. Uh, uh, I haven't had a chance to listen to it in its entirety. I just, you know, cleaned up the audio. That's probably why it was kind of hard to hear, especially if you're listening through the telephone. Um, but you can go to blacktalkradionetwork.com. It's under the BTR News podcast section. Nixon Tape exposes fake American news media control by powerful cult members. Now, just to piggyback on what you just talked about, the Ford Foundation, I was just tweeting at the Ford Foundation. Um, it was either yesterday or the day before yesterday. Now, they have partnered with Van Jones, and Van Jones works for CNN uh, right now, and they're partnering with Van Jones to do, I don't know the details, but they just shared a little bit on Twitter talking about this criminal justice reform initiative. And as Max has pointed out, you can't abolish slavery. It's, this is not mass incarceration. It's a continuation of slavery. If it was mass incarceration, 60% of Americans would be locked up, regardless of their skin color. There's not even 60%, not even 50%, not even 30% of black people that's locked up. But it is a lot of people. It's over a million people at any given time. Uh, I think it's 1.5 million, something like that. Okay? So you can't reform. The, what reform looked like 
of, of reform was the 13th Amendment when they reformed slavery. They didn't abolish it. They just moved it from the plantation to the prison. And so I tweeted at Van Jones and the Ford Foundation, and I expressed those sentiments and tweeted them a copy of the 13th Amendment, an image of the 13th Amendment. So these things are still going on today, okay? And so the whole media, media narrative is about mass incarceration, and we know, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about her. I don't know her personally, but I felt like that coining that term, mass incarceration, you know, uh, Michelle Alexander. Who did she get paid by to write that book? She got paid by George Soros of the Open Society Foundation. Okay, so so all they're doing is trying to prevent us from ending slavery by keep talking about reform, and and that language is being driven through the media. And so this is very important for us to establish our, you know, as I mentioned in that podcast, this is why I establish Black Talk Media Project, a, a nonprofit. Um, we don't get grants from the Ford Foundation. We don't get them from George Soros. They ain't nobody running up to us with no million dollar checks like they ran up to uh, to Black Lives Matter. Uh, who has subverted the black liberation movement and has basically been a stain on the black liberation movement, uh, telling lies about, you know, patriarchy and saying we've had enough heterosexual males leading black liberation and, and we need to make a space for black women and homosexuals and, and all of that. All of that is a distortion of the black liberation movement and they gotten Bitcoin from from these different foundations and donors uh, to the Democratic uh, Party, and it's doing it's doing us a lot of damage. But you know, we do what we can through Black Talk Media Project with the little bit of coins that we do get from our small group of dedicated uh, donors. So it, it is very important. This is why I tell people: if you're going to get into podcasting, if you're going to launch a radio show, okay, you need to take it serious. Because too many of us don't take things serious. We there's so much access to producing our own media. You can go to YouTube. You can go to, you know, these other platforms, and any and everybody can get on there. And then a lot of it is garbage that hasn't been researched whatsoever. But we're just repeating what we heard. Well, what we heard might have been a bunch of lies, and we need to do our own research. And anybody in my opinion, that is going to call themselves an independent citizen journalist, then they need to put in the work. They need to put in that work. Let me see if this is Dave texting me. No, I don't think it is because he uh, said he was only going to be 30 30 minutes late. Um, But yeah, so you'll be able to find um, again, I went through uh, one of the portions. It was 23 minutes long. I listened to part of it, the first part of it, and but I got to listen to the rest because they mention Angela Davis. He mentions the Black Panther Party. It talks about uh, respectful police. It talks about the drug war and all of that. So I can't wait till I have time to, you know, break it down and then, you know, do another podcast breaking it down like me and Max just did. But we are publishing the raw files on Facebook, and the name of that Facebook page is at Richard Nixon Tapes. If you want to follow that page, and of course, we will be, uh, like I told Max, yeah, I'm putting it on there because it has the potential to reach the most people. But when we do our breakdown of these various tapes, then we'll put those on our uh, Black Talk Radio uh, network platform, and of course, I'm saving all the files on my computer so they don't get lost. Um, I think Ross wants to chime in. Ross, uh, thanks for calling in the Tando Radio Show. Um, what do you have to say on this matter? Hey, peace and love, my big brother. It's good to hear you this evening. Um, and of course, you're doing a great job holding Dave down. I'm definitely gonna um look into those Nixon tapes and, and start digging into some of this myself. I didn't get to hear stuff too clearly either, but you know I usually call it from my phone. So um, definitely uh, big up to Max um, just for exposing that this this uh, information is available to us. And um, what you said not too long ago uh, really struck a chord with me about uh, the uh, distortion of the truth about 
when it comes to Black, Black Lives Matter, you're talking about the distortion of our Black liberation movement. And what I find is that there's just mass distortion of just about everything that our ancestors and elders have done. And you have a lot of young people that look like us who haven't done any real research. And, um, you know, they're put, like you said, they're putting out all this information and it's just complete misinformation. And then they have like these religious cult followings of these other young confused victims of white supremacy who will, you know, just tout them as if they walk on water. And um, I remember seeing one recent distortion. There was a guy um, who put out a video, uh, you know, stating he's one of the guys who propagate this concept that, uh, you know, uh, Aboriginal Americans are not African and all of this stuff. And he took a clip from Malcolm X where Mal Malcolm X was discussing the fact that, you know, <laughs> he said we are Aborigines. And if anyone knows Malcolm's history, he's a Pan-Africanist, always has been. But yet the context in which this guy took the clip, he took it to say that, you know, Malcolm knew that, uh, that black people were not from Africa. That was the premise. And this is the, the, the wholesale distortion. There's another guy who's on the same kick who put out a video with Dr. Ben. And, you know, in the, in the title, you know, Dr. Ben knew blacks were here before Columbus. Of course he did. But Dr. Ben was also a Pan-Africanist and one of Malcolm X's closest confidants pure distortion and then you have all these people going in these threads in these comment sections talking about this, this so-called information that these people are putting out completely out of context distorting the legacy and, and the actual facts of what these people said and did and the context in which they said and did it and they have these like I said it's like a, it's like almost religious the way that some of these folks act and I think um, this is not by accident I just think that because of the advent of social media you know, we have a lot more access to agent provocateurs. And a lot of right. these agent provocateurs have their own agenda. And as long as, the, and for some of our people who don't do their due diligence, as long as a person says what they want the person to say or what they believe is true but have no proof of themselves, they just take it and run with it. I learned and to new, me, that is one of the, oh, go ahead. I learned a new term. Um, from psychology. I posted it in BTR community the other day, and I mm -hmm. think you chimed in on it, Ross, but it is called confirmation bias. And in yes. a nutshell, what confirmation bias is, is when we cherry pick information from different sources, from well-known sources, but we cherry pick that information as long as it lines up with our personal yeah. biases or our personal viewpoints, and we ignore or we set aside all other evidence that's to the con contrary. I did not know there was a psychological term for that, but it's called confirmation bias. And so just an example of that, you know, I put out a podcast last week about um, when you had um, um, uh, one of Martin Luther King's uh, closest friends, Harry Belafonte, said that, you know, he gave a PBS interview, and he said the only thing left for black people to do is burn it down, Okay. So that's a reference to uh, Dr. King saying, I fear we're integrating our people into a burning house. Now, some people have taken that to mean that he said integration was wrong, which all integration was, was civil rights laws, which allow you to sue someone, like, for example, for racial discrimination, like what we saw in um, with, um, uh, what is it? Uh, what's the name of the coffee? Come Starbucks. OK, Starbucks, yeah. yeah, it allow if you can prove your case, you can go to court and you can recover damages. And if you got enough evidence, they probably won't even go to court. They'll settle out of court. That's all that was employment uh, legislation, employment, employment rights, labor rights um, and voting rights. You know, if you're going to take taxes from me, how, how the hell are you going to deny me a right to vote for something, vote in something that I'm paying for? So that, that's what that was. So that's not what he meant. What he said was, if you look at the entire quote, which I published in his conversation with Harry Belafonte was, he was saying that America ain't never going to be moral. It's, it doesn't have a moral vision. It is not, it's going to keep practicing injustice and the victims of that injustice is going to burn it down. That's what he was talking about. 
So yes, sir. Yeah. So you know, uh, again, look up that term. It's called cock. It's called uh, uh, what's the term again, man? I'm getting confirmation right. confirmation bias. And I actually looked at that article. I chimed in on that thread. And to me, the confirmation bias is just a form of mental illness, and it ties into cognitive dissonance and reading comprehension. Because I find all three of those things go hand in hand as far as what what I see amongst some of some victims. You know, um, and we've experienced that even on on BTR community, where you know some some folks will put up articles and haven't really read the article and make these outlandish statements. And when you read the article, the statements they make have nothing to do with what's in the article, or it's just a complete, like you said, distortion of what was in the article. And um, you know, it's just a lot of that going on. And I just think that that is extremely dangerous. Because we're in a time in which, like Dr. Wilson said so eloquently before she passed away, that, um, you know, white people are trying to go back to a more overt form of domination, white supremacy, and practicing slavery and human trafficking. And this is not the time for misinformation. Like, it's, like you said, if you're going to be doing this kind of stuff, this work, you have to take it really, really seriously because it's not a game. You know, this is, this is life and death situations, and, and people are looking for, you know, potentially life-saving information. So if you read an article and can't even comprehend what you read, you shouldn't be speaking on it. It just, it just doesn't make sense to me. And there's just more and more of that. And then YouTube, just like you said, is a platform where you can learn a lot, but you have to be very discerning about what you're listening to or watching and who is giving that information. And then as you start to pay attention, especially if they're taking clips and quotes, from our ancestors, and if you know the history of those ancestors, based on, again, a cognitive dissonance, these people have their own agenda, and they're making up a narrative around, you know, a three- to five-minute segment of something that an ancestor said, and they're not even there to defend themselves, but the history is there as far as their position on things, but this person is distorting that truth, and then they have a bunch of followers just yes men chiming in, or yes women chiming in behind them, and saying, yeah, 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 this person got it right. And I'm like, well, you couldn't have actually done your research or even read anything about that person and come to that conclusion. Let me or, let me give like you an example said, of that. Just outright liar. Go ahead. What you let gonna me say? give you an example of that, and we're going to take our station identification break at the top of the hour and and uh, let Dave uh, reclaim his time on his show. Uh, but uh, I saw a clip of Martin, um, not Muhammad Ali. Somebody posted a clip on Twitter of Muhammad Ali saying, you mentally ill if you want to go somewhere that that people don't want you and all that. Well, you can say that about the United States. You know what I'm saying? White people don't want us here. They wanted to get rid of us after the Civil War. They even paid big money to establish the, the African nation of Liberia and ship a bunch of Africans there. But everybody didn't want, didn't want to leave. But, but um, so this person used that clip um, and they also use one of Malcolm X, but not sharing how these people had evolved in their view as they gained more knowledge. That's the beautiful thing about Malcolm X that his story tells me is it shows a evolution of his viewpoints and yes. his ideology as he traveled the world, as he read more and he gathered more information and I published an article in response that well I didn't publish it but I shared an article in response from a quote from Muhammad Ali saying his biggest regret in his life was he turned his back on Malcolm X and that that he wished he'd have been able to tell him he he was sorry because everything he said was true and that and, and that he was ahead of his time and what have you so you know a lot of people don't even realize Malcolm X the app the uh afro american uh the organization for african american unity which was modeled after the organization on the continent of africa was part of the civil rights movement okay this, yes. this is when he created his own but listen we're at the top of the hour of course you know i got to turn it over to dave and um I'm listening, brother. Thanks for the for the conversation. I mute myself. All right. Well thank you for chiming in and uh also thank you to Mario for chiming in. But let me just say this. It is not a conspiracy theory for me to tell you that you're being lied th- to through these corporate media outlets. You just got the conspiracy facts from Nixon 
on that tape. It, when I when somebody's talking about a conspiracy theory, that means I'm theorizing about something. I'm using circumstantial evidence. I don't really know for sure, but it looks like this is the case. It, it, it does not look like it's the case that we're being lied to by mainstream corporate media. And, and when I say that, I'm not talking about just television. I'm talking about television, cable news. I'm talking about radio. I'm talking about newspaper. It doesn't look like they are lying to us and feeding us a bunch of disinformation. That is what they're doing. And it's just, and it's confirmed not only in this particular segment of that Nixon tape, but it's also been confirmed in, in other things as well, as I talked about the church committee. So again, you like Ross used the term discerning. You have to be discerning about everything that you read everything and I always tell people don't even take my word for nothing all right I, uh, I, I appreciate that people trust that I do my research but you still should verify it for yourself so you know for yourself okay so with that said we're going to take a station identification break and on the other side uh brother Dave will reclaim his time you're listening to Tando radio show right here on the black talk radio network stay tuned you are tuned in to the Black Talk Radio Network. For podcasts and live program scheduling, visit us on the web at blacktalkradionetwork.com. All right, welcome back, everyone, to Tando Radio Show, brought to you by Black Talk Radio Network. It's your boy Dave from L.A. Uh, caught in with, uh, just got in a little while ago, was here in Roz and Scotty um, hold it down for us here. Thank you so much, because this is not my show. This is our show, and I greatly appreciate it. I heard that Mario called in and chimed in. I heard uh, Roz had called in and chimed in. I didn't get to hear the tape that Scotty had of uh, Crixon, uh and I, and I didn't say that wrong. He was a crooks, and all of them was a crooks. You got to know a lot about the the the, the Nixon in the bushes. The Nixons in the bushes go go hand in hand, and they were very instrumental in the overall expanding of the Nazi Party in this in the overall country, which was already there before they were born, and was a part of the overall fiber of this of this organization or, or this corporation known as the United States. So, man, I missed it. I wish I would have heard it. I was just hearing some good things uh, from Scotty and from Roz because that was the only two people that I heard. Um, and I just want to say thank you all. Thank you, brothers, uh, for, for chiming in and doing what you do. Scotty, thank you for holding it down. And I heard um, confirmation bias uh, was, was talked about. Yeah, I call that ego bias. Confirmation bias, I call it ego bias. It's, it's all about your ego. Uh, you, you, most people don't search for uh, truths. You know, and the thing about searching for truths is that it's very easy to be biased in that overall search. And the real thing that I always try to, and what I learned to, to do was to let the evidence of the truth lead you to the path of this existence. Because as I always say, the truth doesn't need you. You need the truth. And we all have different forms of truth. But great, great uh, part of the show, um, I didn't get to hear that, that first part. But big ups to my man, Roz. Big ups to uh, Scotty. So um, I'm definitely going to uh, try to hear this over again. And um, I heard some things about reading comprehension. Oh, man. Whew, very, very important. Um, and, and reading comprehension comes from picking up the overall spirit. And as Scotty and, and Raj was talking about discernment, picking up the overall spirit of the intent of the of the language that's being used, and the message is trying to convey without giving up what its true intentions are. It's always an agenda, always, always an agenda. We need to be very uh, uh, aware of that. Yes, everything that we there's propaganda in everything and there's an a, a an intent by all that do speak and you have to find out what is that individual's intent you know so i love the old saying that you know the there's there's two different forms of lying in in the overall spectrum of society but as many forms but 
One form of lying is like politicians. Politicians lie to keep you from the truth, while an artist may lie to you to get you to it. So, and that's because we're so we've been so thoroughly, uh, you know, indoctrinated into being so easily manipulated because we don't have real self we, we we can't you know our overall ability to have uh being able to self sustain is minimum so we're always seeking we're always looking for self validation we're always looking for someone to agree we're always looking for and and agree from just the egotistical standpoint not from the building standpoint that's why I love you all here uh because my overall I see that you all are definitely building things because there is no leadership uh, that we have here. We are all trying to do what's in our best interest individually, in our best interest as a family unit, in our best un interest as a community unit. But we got another caller in queue, and I'm going to go to that uh, caller um, real quick. Uh, my man uh, Otis is there, but before we go to Otis, I'm going to say I'm going to pick up on what today's show would have been, not today, um, because it's just too much to it. Um, and so we'll just have open discussion um, and, and jump back in on some different things. I, I would love to. I'm sorry I missed that with, with uh, Nixon, the crook. Uh, all of these celebrity figureheads are major, major uh, crooks. And, you know, so wish I would have heard uh, that. So let's go to my man, uh, Brother Otis. Brother Otis, welcome to Tando Radio Show. What say you, bro? What's up? What's up, gentlemen? I just wanted to throw something out because we're talking about comprehension and taking things out of context, confirmation bias. I had a, a, a really knockdown drag out in real time when Obama gave his speech, and he used a phrase that we heard repeatedly, a rising tide lifts all ships. And I was listening to it with a group of people that I've known all my life, and they thought, well, yeah, yeah, he's right, he's right. I said, well, see, that's part of not comprehending something. He hooked you on something. Tell that to a man <laughs> stuck in the middle of an ocean in a shanty or overboard with no life raft. Who gives a damn about the ships when you don't got no ship? <laughs> the analogy is, is useless. What, what good does it do to tell you a rising tide lifts all ships, and you're stuck on shore with the rising tide living in the shanty. <laughs> you right. and, and you know, and the and, and, and the rising tide meaning is going to, that their overall ships of subjugation and enslavement are going to be traveling the high seas and delivering the cargoes of death throughout the world. The rising tides of whose ships? And the rise of ties of what ships? And you're absolutely right, Otis. And this is why I think it's so important for us to not to not only have reading comprehension, but to have comp comprehension of what a person's intentions are. And people will pretty much tell you what their intentions are by their actions, by their historical truths, by their by their habits, by their direct direction. And that was part of, you know, for, for today's uh, show, and, and Otis brought up a great, great point that, you know, we were so, and it's so easy to sway the people by the eye, the, the weak sense of the eye, because it feels good, it looks good, so it must be good. All poison is sweet. And as as he says, all ships rise with uh, um, uh what was it again, Otis? It was uh, all ships rise with the rising tide. What, what was it again? Rising tide, rising tide lifts all ships. If you're not rising on the ship, tides, right? What good is that to you? <laughs> you don't have right. a ship. <laughs> right, right. Rising tides lifts all ships, and exactly. And not only that, it's it's. And what Otis is saying is that you have there is no benefit for you. The rising tide for the ship that's already. We want we, you. Sh we should actually remove all of our energy from this system. And I'm definitely going to uh, for Monday show, uh, which we will have for for today's show. And uh, to d the title of today's shows was is about time countries die for their citizens because too often the ri the rising of the tide lifting their ships is their warships. 
and their warships hit the, the sail of the overall seas to bring ab about death and destruction and famine and sickness and, and um, to, to, to disenfranchise people globally. Well, it's time. It's about time for countries to die for the citizens instead of citizens dying for their countries. You know, there was a so-called speech, and I remember when I was a child and I first heard about the speech, and I called BS on it. And it was Kennedy when he said, don't ask what your country could do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. You out your mind. You out your mind. And this is all the, the part of the overall propaganda that we are constantly bombarded with. So then we start to think that we're crazy or other people that talk against the system is crazy. When the one that's really nuts is the one that goes for the overall program. Yay. Yes, sir. Before you move on, I got to throw in my other least favorite one. When all yes. of these politicians tell you, I hate identity politics. What the hell are you saying? If you don't <laughs> have your interest in mind, which is your identity, what the hell should I be politicking for? <laughs> there is nobody that doesn't doesn't practice identity politics. It is exactly what it is. I identify what I need, and then I go lobby my my government to get my taxpayers' money back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly And you know It's so, so true And this is why I'm going to tell you We have to use A different consciousness We have to look at Look at things From a different consciousness Just because Those individuals Over there Want to practice and, and engage And have these activities Doesn't mean That we need to Participate in it Once we stop Participating Then now You can establish Some identity because what's been actually identified for us is that we've identified ourselves as citizens of the United States, as having constitutional civil rights and all these other things. And as you always hear me say, before you proclaim some something, some delusionary myth or a, a doctrine of, of subjugation and enslavement such as your civil rights, you better read the civil rights, see what it says in it first. And, and have an understanding of what that means. Civil rights in, ensures enslavement. As you always hear Scotty say, it's never been abolished. It's never been abolished. It's never been challenged. It's always reinvented or revolutionized itself. And so... Pick up to you, uh, L.A. Ramon. Um, yes, I will definitely check out uh, that. So if you'd like to get in on the conversation on anything today, give us a call, 704-802-5056, 704-802-5056. Um, I really don't want to get too deep into um, anything other than the momentum that's already been uh, established, and I just want to thank, once again, Scotty, thank uh, all of you. Uh, Mario, I heard Mario called in, Brother Otis called in, and Roz has always called in. Um, so... Hey Dave. Hey, you, yeah, go ahead, Scotty. Yeah, if I if I may, I want to chime in on something you said about slavery's never been abolished. I have a different point of view on that, and it has been about. I mean, it has been challenged. It was challenged every time somebody ran away <laughs> from their enslavement. They right. were challenged. <laughs> they were challenging right. their so enslavement. So true, Scotty. So true. Yeah. So so there has always been an abolitionist movement ever since the advent of slavery and, and that's throughout world history but I focus particularly on the history here and you know right. the reason that they had to reform slavery which is what the 13th amendment did it reformed it and placed it in the hands of the state and, and, and what have you but it's still private individuals can practice it by just buying stocks and companies that use prison slave, slave labor so but we are challenging it now, you know, new abolitionist movement. We're challenging in enslavement right now. Mm -hmm. But here's my concern, though, that in the media plays a role in it. We have bought into the, to this lie that slavery has been abolished. And the media right. distract us with symptoms. I'm not saying racism isn't a problem, 
But I'm saying the media focuses more on racism and addressing little individual acts of racism. And it it high, it obscures the fact that they practice in slavery. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that's what really right. needs to be challenged is slavery in all its forms. But, yep. I, you know, I really focus in on the physical enslavement because we got brothers and sisters on these prisons who are being murdered. If you see what see what happened, you know, in South Carolina recently and, and what have you. So, you know, we are challenging. There have always been small groups of people who have challenged slavery and if we could just get a majority of the people to challenge it, it it'll be abolished. But again, we keep getting distracted, man, by other issues. Again, not saying these other issues are not important, but to me, it's about priorities. And my number one priority is to end slavery. Right. And you know what, Scotty, let, let me uh, reemphasize or, 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 or put uh, a, 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 something a little plainer by me because you're absolutely right when i when i said that it hasn't been challenged i i, I was saying more but there's never been an institutionalized uh challenging of it and you're absolutely right those that run away are challenging the abolition movement challenges um and the the you know racism is what the system actually created so it always wants you to fixate your overall vision to that because that's a facade of what the true intention is. The true objective is to have subjugation and enslavement. The stealing of energy, that's what the true true objective is, and you're absolutely right. So I would say, let me put it in a better context that represents what I'm really saying, because what you were saying, I totally agree with, and that's really what I meant, was that today's today's world subjugation and enslavement is has just been revolutionized it's 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 just been able to have an evolutionary process it's, it's been able to have a nurtured process to maintain its overall stronghold and in, in, in its its footing and its foundation into our everyday global society and you're absolutely right and the challenges haven't been from a institutional or a massive global movement by those that are being adversely affected by the overall subjugation and enslavement because many think that they're not enslaved. Many don't know that they are, and if they don't know that they are, how will they ever know that they're ill, that they need to be able to to actually seek a cure instead of health care? And so totally agree with you, uh, Scotty. Um, and it, it was that was just the way that I was representing, and, and it was um, you clarified it, and I just it was the same thing that I was saying um, in a different way, um, and so I just wanted to make that clear. Totally, totally agree. That is so true. Every time that a person runs, that's an individual choice because that's the most powerful thing is the execution of your will. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't follow the crowd. I don't follow the crowd. I don't believe that there's safety in numbers. I don't believe that. I don't live by that. I realize that my talents and abilities were given to me uniquely, individually, as a free will to be executed by me. And I love to work through cooperation with that. So because of that, I respect every individual's execution of their free will you could do whatever you want my thing is that once you your overall free will encroaches on someone else's that's where the boundaries are that's where you're overstepping your ability now was going to be a this is what you heard it before this is a fight of wills you ever hear them talk about uh, uh, the fight of wills but in this situ- and you know here we've lost our will to contest and to contest from a standpoint of not being included. So what they don't want to include you in this? That's a good idea for you to walk away from it. But see, the system knows by having that overall exclusionary emotional tie to it, then that will make you want it even more. If you really think about how this system has indoctrinated us, when something doesn't, when we can't have something, 
we wanted even more because we didn't know that that's the overall what we've been taught and everything because you're never taught why you shouldn't have what you're taught is that you're not entitled to it because somebody else is. Somebody else can have it. You're not good enough to have it. And we've allowed ourselves to be so easily manipulated to our own demise that that type of feeding, and that plays itself throughout our whole life. It takes deep root in ourselves. It, it conjures bitterness. It establishes a foothold for anger. And anger is always the Achilles heel to wisdom. Always. And we always need to be wise because there is a very shrewd evil fox or very shrewd evilness that is constantly devouring and chasing. Then it's institutionalized itself in all of the propaganda that we eat, it realizes the importance of your will and your in your energy. We don't. We don't. So yes. Thoroughly, thoroughly. And I greatly appreciate that. Hey, if you'd like to get in on the converse, conversation, give us a call. 704-802-5056. 704-802-5056. Now, with that being said, you know, we could talk about things at, at you know, f but until we put actions behind different things. And I, I think it's very important for us, in, for you, and I know it's been extremely important for me, so I'll just talk about me. It's been very important for me to take responsibility, good and bad, good and bad, for the things I want and things I don't want, the things I like and the things I don't like. And that's not always a very easy thing to do, but it is a very healthy thing to do. And we have to take responsibility for what we know about some of the things that we know is going on. We may not know the exact thing that's going on, but we know that the overall agenda is an evil one. So there could, we should never really make any deals with that system unless we plan on losing that portion of our soul and we continue to make deals with it and I think one of the most powerful things is for us to just to start saying no to ourselves on small things and allow those things to start to build up because everything that we we are bombarded with and all of the burdens that we bear they didn't come on they didn't come on um, in a gradual process as, as though we may think they were dropped on us immediately and it's been institutionalized through our parents grandparents and everything that we held dear to and we loved and everything that we claimed we claimed certain cities as ours we claimed certain blocks as ours we claimed certain people as ours we claimed certain organizations that, as ours we have uh, claimed certain corporations as ours we claim certain ideology as are and, and, and the thing about in claiming those type of things is that that brings on the energy and the spirit that goes along with it there are inanimate objects that can have a spirit now because we we as individual and as, as people can give our energy to something and that thing can start to live based off of the energy that we put into it our energy is so so strong that we can actually raise the dead. An inanimate object is a non-living object. We can give our energy to it, and that can have a spirit. A tank is an inanimate object built by men, energized by men for the purpose of men. Now that tank lives. Artificial intelligence cars, buildings. That's why giving of our energy is so important. We have to be extremely frugal.
and there's a great responsibility into what we give energy into. Because whatever we give energy to, it shall too live. It rises from the state of, of non-existence into the state of existence and relevance. Because now it has power. This is why you start to hear a lot of artists singing about different things. And they talk about day. power. Yes, yeah, someone um yes, yeah, someone said Brother Dave. Yes. Hey, peace and love, King. This is Ross. How you doing? My man, what's up, Ross? What's going on? Ross, hold on. You know, one thing I man, I appreciate um some of the things that you were saying, uh, you and Scotty, and I really do appreciate um, you know, we talked about people posting things and not really knowing what's what's in them. You know? Absolutely. And you know, that's you know, it it's It's always been, you know, it's it, rising. It, the, the thing that, that happens is that our egos play out in so many different ways, and, and we become some of our, our greatest illness. I agree. I agree. And, you know, and I think it's really important for when sometimes people will, and in today's world, speaking is not given much thought. Everything that you speak is, is actually the birthing of so much. And we've, we've, we've gotten away from the importance of it and how fragile speech is. Speech is, is extremely fragile. It's as as fragile as our as our physical lives. Yes, sir. They both work off of a frequency that is so so valuable that it could be damaged in put in a different direction than what's intended. It's fragile, extremely fragile, it's extremely breakable. And so when, when you were talking about that, that's, that's so true. And I'm going to tell you, one of the things that I've, I've noticed throughout our, my existence is that we've, we've lost a real harmony and connection with people in itself. And we actually condemn much too much. And instead of embracing as much as we possibly can, because people are always going to make mistakes. People are always going to do things that's wrong. But, you know, the, the, the smart thing to do is wise people always try to seek good counsel. Yes, sir. And we, we very rarely do we actually try to seek good and great counsel because it, Today's world is is really pushed upon separating ourselves from everyone else to do what's in your best interest and your best interest only. Run everything and everybody else over that you possibly can. So I was glad that you talked about that. And oh, I think thank you. Go ahead. you know the church itself has lost its overall compassion for the for the people that it can touch because it's turned into a business. And compassion can never be a bottom line venture. It can only be a sustainability venture. And you know it's you funny know, you so, said that because it's always been a business. All you got to do is go back to uh, King Leopold's letter to his missionaries. I believe it was written in 1881, where he tells the pe tells his uh, missionaries. You know, they have one of the most important jobs for the colonialists. And one of the main jobs was to collect tithes and offerings and not use it to help people, but to build thriving business centers that are owed to the system of white supremacy. It's all documented in the letter. Um, so you're absolutely right. It's always been a business, especially when it comes to the colonization of non-white melanated people globally. Now, what right. you just said about uh, the the ego is powerful because... You know, I I came from a hip hop music background, and that is to me the biggest ego based industry ever. 
you know, and, and hold on, rise, 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 rise. Hold on, we we at the half hour. Hold on, one second, okay. bro, because I don't want you to get too far in this. Because uh, going to talk about the ego base of, of hip hop. Gary, got to go to this commercial break. You're listening to Tando Radio Show. If you'd like to get in on the conversation, seven zero four eight zero two fifty fifty six. Give us a call. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Black Talk Radio, since 2008, providing new black media for the masses. Okay, welcome back, everyone, to Tando Radio Show. Uh, if you'd like to get in on the conversation, give us a call, 704-802-5056. My man, Rise, was sounding off. Uh, so go ahead, uh, Rise, let's go back to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, like I said, that industry is basically an industry based on bragging, boasting, and ego. That's you Go back to the origin of hip-hop, that's what it started as. People were bragging, boasting parties. Um, you know, if you go back to the Caribbean where hip-hop really started, go to Jamaica, they used to do toasting. And toasting is where one sound system would basically, you know, try, try to outdo and out-volume another sound system. And they bragging about their team and how their team get down and, you know, my team's better than your team. That's how all of that started. Transferred to the United States with Cool Hurt, and we have hip-hop. So when, when I got into it, you're talking about the golden age. <laughs> So my ego was big, and a lot of us carried our egos from street stuff. So you got to take that street ego, which is huge, because a lot of the stuff you do in the street is what gives you the pedigree to go into business and say what you say on the mic. Because whatever you say, sometimes people will test you on what you say. You know, and even if you had that, that, that reputation, quote unquote, they'll still test you, you know, and that's a fact. So you got to be able to back up what you're saying. A lot of these people today will talk and they just loose with the lips and have no gusto. And I'm, it's not even about the ego aspect for me as I transition from music to writing and, you know, helping my people and doing lectures and things like that. And what facilitated that transition was my spiritual practice. That's where I got a hold of my temper. That's where I got a hold of my ego. And I was able to discern clearly where my ego was a detriment because I was very, very spitfire. It didn't take nothing for me to get physical. I didn't like to do a lot of talking. I st I'm still like that to a degree, but I'm under a lot more control because I'm older and wiser, but my temper's still there. So, you know, and being a victim, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and especially a victim who is not prone or apt to really tolerating stuff from the colonizer, you know, it's something that I have to still work on at times, depending on the context of what's happening in my day. But the whole idea is that once once you understand that the ego is something that uh, can really put you in situations that can get very ugly if you're not wary about it. To me, the ego is just, just as bad as uh, uh, any other bad habit because it's something that clouds your vision. And it comes, the egos usually come into play with emotional situations. So when you get emotional, you more tend to be about ego. As I got deeper into, into what I do now, that is out the window. And the people who taught me, these, you know, the greatest of our people who taught me, that was something that they made emphatically clear. They made emphatically clear the importance of, you know, really researching things and, and getting to the bottom of things and understanding things on a, on a, on a really good level before speaking about them. This is all stuff I got from them. And the whole thing in a nutshell is you'll find that even to this day, you'll see that the people, the, or even I'll just go stick with rap, the rappers with the biggest egos have gotten into the biggest trouble all the time. They might make a lot of money. They might get a lot of notoriety, a lot of fame, all your social media stuff, but you'll find that they're constantly either in trouble with other human beings or in trouble with the law. And it's just a balance you have to find. And the, the crazy part is um, yesterday I found out from my wife that within 48 hours, three different young black children <laughs> uh, attempted suicide that we are connected to. One of them passed away. 
um, and then she was in Manhattan. She actually um, threw herself out of a window. And th what happened behind her doing that was that her parents didn't allow her to go to a party. So that was the, the, the driving force for her making this decision. But there were, of course, other things that led up to that. But it just ties into the fact that even the ego can be mental illness. Because if it pushes you to the point where you cease to want to exist, or it pushes you to the point where you end up doing something to someone else, for no reason, it's not like it's self-defense, it's just your ego, which is, that's what we came from, that's what I came from. So, um, it's just not a good thing. And what you were talking about kind of made me think about this young sister, because she was only 14, you know, um, and it was just really sad to, to, to get this news and have to talk to these people and, and, and kind of build on this stuff. And the other part, too, you talked about, um, you talked about uh, sorts of things and how you create things by the energy you put into them. One thing that I've always looked at, if you go to Nollywood, which is basically African version of Hollywood, they don't make horror movies because in African culture, exactly what you said applies. Whatever you put your thought I, thoughts, ideas, and spiritual energy to become living things. We breathe the breath of life into things that we actually interact with. So even when you look at the horror movie scene, some of the, some you'll hear stories of white people in this country committing murders wearing a ski mat, wearing the um, um, hockey mat. Where did they get that from? So they they created real life Jasons just by putting Jason in a film. They created real right. life Texas Chainsaw Massacres by putting that in film. You know, the same thing with The Purge. You know, you look at Katrina, Katrina was The Purge. Black people running from, you know, a hurricane and floodwaters and police and colonizers setting up and gunning them down as they're running to safety unarmed. That's The Purge right there. So the idea of what you put your thoughts and energy to is of the utmost importance. Even when you look at uh, social media, Facebook, all of these things, I've posted numerous articles that talk about the fact that your attention is money. If they can get your attention, they're making money off of you hand over fist. And that's the same thing that applies even to misinformation. And that's why I say that this, this, this age, this information age, is probably the most highly reform, reform, refined form of COINTELPRO I've ever seen. Because you have so many people with the access to reach massive amounts of people, but if the people who are reaching these massive amounts of people don't have any personal integrity, don't really do their due diligence, then they're doing the job for the colonizer for them. Some of these people are definitely getting paid, but there's others who just have their own ideologies. They're not really, um, it's not their intention to misinform people. But if you haven't really gotten the understanding of how to do certain things as far as researching and, 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 um, and, and, and cross-referencing, cross triangulating to get to the point where you understand, okay, this information is actually accurate, I can move forward with it, then even if you're trying to do something good, you can still sometimes ruin people's lives. Because like I said, this is life and death stuff. Like People take this for a joke. I don't take this for a joke. The people who, who I grew up under, these were the people who put their lives on the line every day at a time when they were killing us for a lot less than they're killing us for now. So the whole thing in a nutshell is if you're doing, doing this type of work, you want to understand that it's no less important than if you're an emergency services worker. You got to put in the, 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 the actual time and effort to really get deep into what you're doing and then present that information once you're sure. And if you do make an error, like you said, we all do at times, you just correct yourself. Hey, you know, when I was talking on this particular subject or this particular article or this, ep this episode of the show, I said such and such and so, and, you know, that was actually an error. Let me correct myself. This is what the situation really is. That's it. You know, and if you can do that, right. then you find that you'll grow. And then people will respect you more and people will be more apt to listen to you. Cause I tell people, I told my son the same thing. I said, don't ever listen to anything I said, go do your research. I'll tell you, this is, these are my sources. Anytime I've written an essay, I put all my sources in the essay. So people can go see it and understand this is why I take this position in this essay. When I write what I write, as you compile the information I use to do my research, then you can say, wow, now I understand why he took this position. It's not just me throwing these ideas out there and just willy-nilly saying stuff and then just running off at the mouth. It's really trying to get to an understanding as to why did I formulate this thought pattern on this particular subject. The information is what drove me towards the truth, 
And the truth is this based on the research. That simple. Thanks, my brother. I'll mute my line. Phenomenal show as always. And big up to Scotty. He was holding you down quite well. And peace to Otis, too, and brother on Rio as well. And Max, too. Peace and love. <laughs> my man. My man, Rod. So, so much uh, that, that was said as always. And, you know, I've always – and I, I, I think it's really – important for us to be as humble as we possibly can because what we can build from I tell you I, one of the things that I always um, always thought and I, I kept quiet among myself I always l- love to lose I always love to lose because I've always thought that losing before you can become a winner you have to first learn how to lose because I think that you, in, in doing that, you can learn why things went the way that they went. We, we have such an immature, the system teaches us, and we've, we've actually taught our children ourselves to have such an immature approach to when things don't go right for us. And I had, and I had to, to learn that, and oh, believe me, but when when you take that approach, that means that things aren't going to go right and it's going to be challenged. And you're not going to always meet up to every challenge. Some challenges are going to absolutely floor you. But you can get back up. You can definitely, definitely get back up. And that's what's so beautiful about this moment in eternity that we're in. Is it perfect? I think it is. I really do think it is. Because it's actually giving us the ability to create a better eternal us daily. If we choose to do that. If we choose to do that. And I hope that that's, I know that that's my my overall intentions. Um, I can't say that that is the the right way it's just the chosen way that i that i've decided to to do the best that i possibly can because i don't look at just right now i've learned from losing and becoming a a champion of losing it's really hardened me to to the loss of the temporal momentary things when I'm setting and storing everything up to, to win continuously eternally so that's just um, you know one way that I look at it man uh, time is fine we got another caller in queue I got my man I believe it's Thomas out of NYC Thomas what say you my brother go ahead peace hey what's up brother what's up bro? peace peace bro how you feeling I'm doing good man peace for all the callers um, I had just wanted to say a quick thing. Um, now, Dave, you yes, find sir. out some information that's contrary to what you've been taught your whole life and believe me, and you start mm. researching it and you change your perspective from the research you've done. And the more research you do, you learn more things. Mm-hmm. And you find out new things and you think that this could possibly help your people if they also take the same perspective. And then you try to share it with people that you usually speak to, and even family members, and um, they don't want to hear it. They start calling you names. They don't want to listen to you. They shoot it down as soon as you say it. Let's just take, for instance, when I found out that religion was fake, and I tried to go to my family with that, Oof. how they treated me, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I would say, listen, you know, I don't believe in this. And then it, right, after a right. while, you start saying, F Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Because you, y'all don't want to listen to me. So I don't call that ego. But let's just say Mm-mm. I talk to you about silver from time to time. You mm-hmm. know I know a little bit about silver. And I know the value mm-hmm. of it. And one day mm-hmm. I say, yo, Dave, I just did some research and I found out aluminum is more valuable than silver. And you're like, mm-hmm. get out of here, man. I'm like, Dave, look at the research. I think they've been lying to us this whole time. Right. Are you going to just say, get out of here, I don't want to hear it, you're crazy, or are you going to look at the research? I mean, that that's pretty much all I had to say, brother. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, um, 
I'm going to look at the research. I'm definitely going to look at the free, and I would hope that I would look the the smartest and the wisest thing is always to look at to look at the research and to also to resonate with the possibility of an opportunity for you to learn something more. You know, and it's wow. And because we've been there's been so many deceptive things that have been taught to us so that whatever sounds correct ain't correct just by the overall mathematical uh, equations of of reasoning deduction tells you that system is lying and now the system may not be lying about everything but what the system definitely does is manipulate but to answer your question correctly well you made a mistake bro by telling me something about silver and I put so much of my life into this I'm going to say what I'm going to say, what? And you're going to have my full undivided attention. You know, my friends and, and family members will tell you, I talk to, I don't care who it is. When there's certain things, when you, when, you, when you actually spark someone's passion, there's a silence that comes, comes along because, because you've been in tune to learning as much as you can about something your your whole when there's another opportunity to develop yourself even more and evolve even more you listen for that opportunity and you focus you say here I am but I know exactly what you mean brother when you talked about Thomas when you talked about some of the institutional things that the people that we love the most, how committed they are to something, to where they will excommunicate you for not following the path of everybody else. Why can't you just, everybody else does? I've always, how many times have you heard that throughout life? Why can't you just be like everybody else? Does everything have to be a conspiracy theory? No, there's no such thing as a conspiracy theory. It's just a conspiracy agenda. And you know to yourself, you don't speak to them in the way that they speak to you because of how you've evolved to where you kind of understand. But you also know that, hey, I still need to be le- learning some things. I could be wrong. I could, there'd be something, there could be something that I don't know. But when you talk about that historical family, traditional things, where the family will excommunicate you for certain things, let me just say this. It's better for them to excommunicate you in respect than to, for you and for us to uphold them in deception and destroy their eternal opportunities. It's better to be the to take the sacrifice and the hit because your shoulders are big enough. That's why you question. People with small shoulders shoulders never question. They don't always obey because they got strong enough shoulders and big enough and broad enough shoulders to bear the burdens that come along with it. And that's what is always going to happen. You want to stand out like a sore thumb? Speak against the overall crowd. Speak against what's popular. Speak against what's deceptive. Speak the truth in the land of lies. What happens is this. The truth becomes the lie, and the lie becomes the truth. The truth is what people live every day that may be based in some falsehoods, but it's their truth. So the dynamics of our overall free will is so powerful. And this is why we have to first start on an individual journey. One of the first things that a young prince and a young princess must master is the art of being lonely. You have to master that. Because when you start to 
execute your talents and ability from the from the free will that you have, you're gonna find yourself that you were born alone, you live alone, and you're ultimately gonna make the great transformation alone. So shall it be. So great, great point, brother. And this is part of our development that we all need to to, to continue to go through. I, I don't think that there's anyone that's that's reached their full potential because I'm not looking at other people's full potential because I know I haven't reached mine, so I don't hold that burden against someone else. So we all have a journey. And I'm going to tell you, the greatest thing that you can do is serve. The greatest thing that you can do is the most, most admirable great creator ability that you have is to serve because that's how we got here through service so i think we got um, one more caller out of um got a caller out of oh this is this is d a caller out of chicago d what's going on what say you i've been trying to find you man <laughs> I know. I saw some of your texts and everything. I, man, I, I tell you, just uh, I'm gonna tell y'all. Check this out. I had a little, little incident I, I had to deal with. I had a little growth on, um, on my body. I had to go make sure it was it was good. And so, in between working and everything else, so I had a, and I don't like seeing no doctors. So what I did <laughs> is I doubled up. I saw a regular doctor. Then I had to go see a herbalist. Um, to check out what was going on, and uh, so they both said the same thing, and and I'll take care of take care of it all. Um, so I'm good, but um, and I've been crazy, crazy. Okay. <laughs> my okay. man, my yeah, man, Scott, I, he says, as you get older, you'll notice some ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> my man Scotty. So that's what went up, D, and um, I didn't. Uh, we need to definitely catch up, and I'm glad that okay. you called in. That's my I was sister. Let one. me tell y'all, man. I was going to get you one way or the other. Man, De 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 Deborah will throw rocks. De Deborah will fight everything. Boy, where you at? So I love you, D. So, um, but yeah, let's catch up. Okay, you give me a call. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, y'all, we got to get ready to get out of here. It's never goodbye. As always, I'll see you later. Hey, next week, uh, what I want to do is we talked about with the firearms things, we talked about some of the importance of the rounds. We gave you some rounds. What I want to do is uh, give you some um, actual uh, firearms that I think that are relatively cheap, that are reliable and good, and give you some of the reasons why, just in my opinion, we'll do some of that too. So someone said, Dave, yes. Okay. Um, yes, All right, y'all. Never goodbye. As always, we'll see you later. Uh, big ups, uh, Thomas, uh, Mario. Big up, Roz. Big up, uh, Otis and uh, Deborah. Big up, Scotty. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I was late today. I uh, was somewhere, and I couldn't get back. And, you know, Friday traffic in a major city, and especially a major city that you don't know how to traverse, is, is pretty, pretty bad. So much love, much respect. It's never goodbye. And I seriously mean that. It's never goodbye. Ever, ever goodbye. As always, I'll see you later. Big Cal, my big brother Calvin. I'll see you later. And I see, and I see you, bro. I'm feeling the messages you send me. Much love, much respect. We'll talk to you later. Brother Bragg, if you would be so kind to chime us out, we'd greatly appreciate it. Salute to you, too, OG, my man, Brother Bragg. Peace, peace. Hey, uh, peace, hey, peace Dad, Brother Bragg. Yes, sir. I just want to say this, Dad. Anytime, gotcha, any gotcha. day, somebody want to sit down and debate me on my ideals, we can sit down anytime. I'll bring my paper and my pad and my notes. You bring your paper, your pads, and your notes. We'll pull the information up right now. We'll see what's real. We'll see what's false. But I bet you don't want to sit in front of me with my book and my pad. Peace, brother. We all together. Peace, peace, brother. Guys. Much love. Much respect. We'll talk to you. Yes. Peace. 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 Gold dinar would have had serious consequences for the world financial system, but may also have empowered the people of Africa, something black activists say the U.S. wants to avoid at all costs. We're slicing cake. We're slicing cake. We're slicing cake. Slicing.
Gaddafi didn't give up. In the months leading up to the military intervention...